In the first five verses of John's prologue to his biography of Jesus Christ, John wrote, and you've seen this on the PowerPoint and heard me repeat it several times. We're nearing the end, but it's a great prologue. In the beginning was the Word, that is the Logos, the second person of the Godhead. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And Him was life. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in darkness, but darkness has not understood it. In verses 10 through 13... John wrote that when Jesus came to earth, the majority of the men and women in the world did not recognize him as being God. And even his own people, the Jews, did not receive him. But while the majority of the men and women in the world rejected Jesus, there was a small minority who did accept Jesus, and they were rewarded by becoming children of God. Verses 10 through 13, He, the Word, the Logos, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and those who were His own did not receive Him. But, and this is a wonderful but, as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Our journey through the prologue of John's gospel is a journey that has arrived at the point uh, for John writing this book, and that point is this. John is trying to tell us in this gospel of his that the second person of the Godhead became flesh and we beheld his glory. And that's the point of verse 14, the first we're going to be looking at this evening. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We, as we have worked our way through the pro- prologue, we've now arrived at the point of the prologue, in fact, the point of the whole book. The word became flesh. The Word, the Logos, the Creator God of the universe put on flesh, that is, He became a man and dwelt among us, and we saw Him and beheld His glory. A.W. Pink, meditating on this passage, said this, The infinite became finite. The invisible became visible. The transcendent became imminent. That which was far off drew close. That which was beyond the reach of the human mind became that which we could touch. The word incarnation is a word we use to describe God becoming a man, and that is exactly what took place 1,900 years ago when, in the fullness of time, the second person of the Godhead came to earth as a baby born of the Virgin Mary in the Judean town of Bethlehem. God, who is spirit, took on flesh and became a man. And not only did the second person of the Godhead take on the flesh of man, he also took on man's human nature, making him fully God, a fully man, as well as being fully God. When we speak of the incarnation, it's important that you understand that we are speaking of God actually becoming a man, while at the same time remaining fully God. When we speak of the incarnation, we're not speaking of God just inhabiting a human body for a season, a human body he could later remove himself from. When we speak of the incarnation, we're speaking of God actually becoming a man. That's the point. And he became a man to such an extent that his divine nature is so united with his human nature that they will never be separated, making Jesus forever fully God and fully man. In theology, we call this phenomenon the hypostatic union. One theologian described it this way. In theology, hypostatic union refers to the union of Jesus' divine and human natures in one person. In the incarnation, Jesus' human nature was forever inseparably united with his divine nature. 
Yet the two natures remain distinct and wholly without mixture. Thus Jesus Christ is at once fully God and fully man. The incarnation of our Lord is one of the most amazing events in the history of the universe. It is an event that is hard to understand. But it is an event that is clearly supported by Scripture and must therefore be accepted by Christians even though we can't understand it fully. The Incarnation was not a New Testament idea that suddenly sprang from the pens of the apostles. The Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would be fully God as well as being fully man. To begin with, there was never any question in the minds of Jews that the Messiah would be a man. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, God told Moses that the Messiah would be a great, great prophet like Moses himself. And that the Messiah would be raised up among Moses' Jewish countrymen. Deuteronomy 18. And the Lord said to Moses, I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen like you. I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. Later on. God told Samuel to tell King David that the Messiah would be a descendant of his. 2 Samuel 7, great passage. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne, uh, the throne of his kingdom forever. Not only did the Old Testament scriptures predict that the Messiah would be a man, and then particularly a Jewish man descended from King David, the Old Testament scriptures predicted that the Messiah would also be God. Isaiah 9, 6, a passage we're familiar with. For, us, for a child is, will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his so shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And saying that the Messiah would be from the days of eternity. We're being told that the Messiah would be eternal, which is another way of saying that he would be God. Not only was the incarnation one of the most exciting events in the history of the world, it was an event that ushered in a great many blessings for mankind. To begin with, the Incarnation uh, gave us the much-needed kin kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer who would be qualified to rescue us from the slave market of sin and death. Now to understand mankind's need for a kinsman redeemer, it's necessary to understand several principles that God established in the Old Testament era. One of those principles was that of the kinsman redeemer. The idea behind the kinsman redeemer was that when an individual got into trouble, his closest relative or his kinsman, closest kinsman, was expected to bail him out of that trouble. There were essentially three obligations of the kinsman redeemer. The first obligation of the kinsman redeemer was to redeem a relative from slavery and poverty. Let me explain. If extreme poverty led to a man losing his property and then being sold into slavery, his kinsman redeemer was expected to buy back the lost property and restore it to him and purchase his relative out of slavery. In short, a man's closest relative was expected to bail him out of his financial trouble. The second obligation 
of the kinsman redeemer was to avenge a relative's murder. If a man was slain, it was the obligation of the kinsman redeemer to see to it that his blood was avenged. God did not want murderers to go unpunished. I know that's a little frightening in this day and age. Well, we feel the murderer is, in the end, if you listen to defense attorneys, the real victim. Strange, isn't it? God did not want murderers to go unpunished. And it was the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer to see to it that his relative's murderer was punished. The third obligation of the kinsman redeemer was to preserve his relative's name. If, for example, a man died, and he was childless when he died, it was the obligation of the kinsman redeemer to marry his dead relative's wife and bear a child through her. That child will then be given the name of the dead relative, and in doing so, carry on the dead relative's name. So, a kinsman redeemer was a big help. It bailed a man out of financial trouble, which is always nice. It, the kinsman redeemer made certain that a relative's murderer did not go unpunished. And it was the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer to carry on his dead relative's name. A real blessing. Now, what does all this have to do with Jesus Christ? <laughs> Just this. And it's an important principle that God laid down. You and I and the entire human race got into trouble when we, along with our grandparents Adam and Eve, whose loins we were in, sinned in the Garden of Eden. And because of this sin, we found ourselves imprisoned in the slave market of sin and death. We needed a close relative, a kinsman, to redeem us and set us free. But who? All of our kinsmen were sinners and imprisoned in the same slave market of sin and death as we found ourselves. What we needed was a kinsman who was not tainted with sin and a kinsman who would be willing to pay the penalty for our sin. So he had to be a relative without sin and be willing to pay the terrible penalty that was necessary to get us out of that slave market of sin and death. This is where the second person of the Godhead came to our rescue and became our kinsman by becoming a man through the incarnation and then he paid the necessary redemption price on Calvary's cross to set us free. A redemption price that could only be paid by a kinsman who was without sin and who was willing to pay the price. We have a great kinsman in Christ, don't we? The incarnation provided mankind with a kinsman redeemer, one who was actually capable of redeeming us and one who was willing to redeem us. The incarnation also provided mankind with a destroyer who would destroy the works of the devil. This Jesus did on Calvary's cross as well. The writer of Hebrews described it this way. Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. The Apostle John describes our Lord's defeat of Satan this way. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. When speaking about his crucifixion, Jesus said, this in John 12, now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And in John 16, Jesus said, the prince of the world now stands condemned. Now to understand how Jesus defeated Satan at Calvary's cross, it's necessary to understand that Satan has devoted himself to opposing God. In fact, the name Satan means resistor or adversary. Satan's primary effort as God's adversary in the age of man has been an attempt to deny God the pleasure of having human beings 
as part of his heavenly family. Satan undoubtedly, undoubtedly believed that when he tempted Eve into sinning, that Adam and Eve and their descendants would be lost to God forever, in much the same way that Satan and the angels who followed him in rebelling against God were lost to God forever. When Satan and the angels who followed him rebelled against God, they were not given any hope of reconciliation. When Satan and the angels who followed him rebelled against God, they were lost to God forever. When Satan and the angels who followed him rebelled against God, they were banished from heaven and the family of God forever. Satan undoubtedly believed that the same thing would take place when Adam and Eve sinned. Satan undoubtedly believed that Adam and Eve and their descendants would be lost to God forever. Just as he and the angels that rebelled against him were lost to God forever. Satan had been so pleased with himself when he managed to get Adam and Eve to sin. The human race, he must have thought to himself, would now be lost to God and lost to God forever. The human race would now join with Satan and the fallen angels in a kingdom apart from God's kingdom. What Satan didn't count on was that God had another plan. Praise God for that plan. <laughs> Amen for that plan. Some plans aren't so hot in this world, but boy, this is a great plan. And that plan was to humble himself and become a man. And as a man, take upon himself the sins of mankind and in so doing, rescue some of the men and women who had been lost to Satan's family. This is what the writer of Hebrews was getting at when he wrote, Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. The Incarnation provided mankind with a kinsman redeemer, a spotless, sinless kinsman who was not only perfect, but willing to pay the necessary price to redeem us from the slave market of sin. The Incarnation also provided mankind with a destroyer who would destroy the works of the devil. This kinsman of ours, this destroyer, stopped Satan's plan cold. The Incarnation also provided a high priest who at long last would offer a sacrifice that removed mankind's sins. High priests, as you know, offered sacrifices regularly, 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 and they sort of covered sins but never took them away. But when this high priest, Jesus Christ, offered up a sacrifice for our sins, it removed our sins. The writer of Hebrews put it this way. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It was finished. He took care of it. That secures our future, folks. All your sins were taken care of on the cross. He paid the price to make it effective in your life. All you have to do is embrace him as your Savior. This is great news. Not only did the incarnation provide us with a high priest who offered a sacrifice that removed our sins, the incarnation also provided us with an advocate or a lawyer who came from the human race and who also has access to God the Father. An access that enables him to plead our case. And some of us need an advocate working a lot. Some of you have him working overtime. I know I'm there. I'm there. I love this. My little children, 1 John, 1 chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, a lawyer with the Father, Jesus the Righteous. This was of particular importance to Job. Remember Job? Not too long ago, we went through the book of Job. Job, who in the midst of his suffering believed that God and his justice would provide an attorney to plead his case. I need somebody to plead my case. I can't go to heaven and plead it. Job was complaining. 
In Jesus Christ, we have that attorney, an attorney who does plead our case before God the Father. And that's the best, best Jewish attorney you will ever get. <laughs> in New York, we used to joke, I had a Jewish attorney pleading my case in the courts in New York and one in heaven. I was surrounded by Jewish attorneys. I'm doing well. Job 16. Even now, behold, this is Job. Even behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. My friends are my scoffers. My eye weeps to God. Oh, that man might plead with God as a man pleads with his neighbor. Now we have a man who pleads with God on our behalf. Job wanted one. We got one. The best attorney ever. One of the great blessings the Incarnation provided was that it provided us with a man, a fellow human being who gave us a perfect example on how men should live their lives. Matthew eleven twenty, 20. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. John 13, I have set you an example. This is Jesus talking. I have set you an example that you should, not, you should do as I have done for you. 1 Peter 2, 21. To this you are were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. One of the greatest blessings the incarnation provided, and one that for some reason we seldom talk about, is that the incarnation elevated mankind to the loftiest position any creature can have in God's universe. When God became a man, he permanently identified himself with the human race. He became one of us. And this was something he has not done for any of his other creatures. His universe is filled with creatures, but he did, has not chosen to identify himself permanently with any one of them. The only exception is mankind. When God became a man, it meant that he had to stoop to our level of existence. It meant that he had to be humiliated for a season. But for us, it meant being lifted up and seated with God in heavenly realms. Ephesians 2. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Romans 18, 8, 17. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Jesus humiliated himself so that we might be lifted up. Reflecting on this, C.S. Lewis wrote, the Son of Man, Son of God, excuse me, became a man to enable men to become sons of God. I like that. The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. The redeemed man's third estate will be better than his first and obviously better than his second step estate. Man's first estate was his innocence in the Garden of Eden. Not bad. Man's second estate was his fallen condition after he sinned. Not good. Man's third estate is that of being redeemed and finally glorified. The redeemed man's third estate will be better than his first estate and obviously better than his second estate. And we haven't even begun to learn about what it means to be a glorified child of God. God has promised that our future as his children will be more glorious than anything we can imagine. 1 Corinthians 2.9, one of my favorite verses, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, and we owe it all to Jesus and his incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and not only that, he redeemed us and is giving us a destiny of sitting beside him in the heavenlies. This is extraordinary. Finally, the incarnation revealed God to mankind in an incredibly mar remarkable way. On the night before Jesus was crucified, Philip asked Jesus to show the disciples God the Father. 
Jesus replied, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. A short time later, Jesus said, or earlier, Jesus said, when a man looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. And who sent him? God the Father. To the church at Colossae, Paul wrote, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The writer of Hebrews said that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And of course, John wrote in his prologue, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God became a man so that he might reveal God to men and do so in a way that is so beautiful and so magnificent, who would have ever guessed? I'll close with a story that was told by Dr. Raymond Edmond, a past president of Wheaton College. Sean? Dr. Edmund tells the story of a missionary friend of his who labored among the Brahmins in India. That's the high class in India, the Brahmins. The missionary told Dr. Edmund the story of a high caste Brahmin who was greatly impressed by the gospel message. But he stumbled over the incarnation. He just couldn't understand why God would ever become a man. It seemed so degrading to him. Well, it probably was degrading to God. I won't argue that point. The Brahmin had trouble saying, why would God want to do something so degrading as to become one of us? I ask that myself constantly. I've met us. We ain't so good, guys. <laughs> now, as they were walking along together one day, the Brahmin's shadow crossed an anthill. The ants became panicky and started running madly in all directions. The Brahmin believed that it was wrong to hurt any living creature because he was a Hindu, and a major element of Hinduism is reincarnation. And one of those ants could, could have been a departed aunt or uncle. Sorry, uncle. Sorry, aunt. Gramps, sorry. Now, looking at this hopeless situation of ants running in all directions, he told the missionary, I wish I could tell those ants that I love them. I wish I could tell them that there's no reason to be frightened. I wish I could become an ant. That way, I wouldn't frighten them. I would be able to speak to them in their own language. They would listen to me and learn of my love for them. You know where we're going. <laughs> the missionary had his answer to the problem of explaining why the incarnation was necessary. The incarnation was God's way of coming down from his lofty position in heaven to our lowly positions here on earth to reveal himself in a way that would touch our hearts and minds better than any other possible way. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How very blessed we are. We've got a fabulous Redeemer. And we ought to live with the joy and the appreciation of that every minute of every day. We are so blessed, folks. Stop whining. You know, whining is just sinful. I understand problems. I got them. You have them. And I'm never happy about them, so don't misunderstand. I don't celebrate. I know Romans 8.28. I've never really been. I don't, I don't think Romans 8.28 has, has worked its way through my soul yet. But stop whining. We're the most blessed people on this planet. For a season... We've got to put up with some grief, but we have this glorious future. It's all because the second person of the Godhead became a man and redeemed us. What a blessing. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God, for caring so much for us that you dared to humiliate yourself by becoming one of us. Thank you so much. I pray we live in the midst of the joy of this reality every minute of every day. We certainly should. We love you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.